My name is Hannah. I'm the Director of Communications here at Pelican Harbor. Um, and our guest speaker today is actually um, a colleague from my old alma mater, the University of Delaware. Uh, we met way back then um, at the wildlife, uh, was it the wildlife ecology program or wildlife? I forget even the name of it. Um, yeah, we uh, met in, in Woody Plants class. Oh, yeah, that was we the main of my existence. <laughs> Um, and so Katie is like an amazing, phenomenal, incredible ornithologist. And I just absolutely love that your name is Katie Bird. I just I can't get over that. You were born <laughs> to do this. Um, so without further ado, I'll let Katie introduce herself and we can uh, get into the presentation. Thank you so much, Hannah. And thank you for Pel to Pelican Harbor for having me. Um, just a quick warning what, before I get into my presentation, there are some photos of dead birds, so there's nothing graphic, but if you're sensitive to that kind of thing, this might not be the webinar for you. And, and with that, um, my presentation is Mitigating Bird Window Collisions and Miami Migration. Oh, so who am I? Like Hannah said, I'm Katie Bird, and yes, that's my real name that I was born with. Uh, <laughs> I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a master's student at University of Delaware. Currently, I study the movement ecology of purple martins in the mid-Atlantic region using both weather radar and radio telemetry. So in the left picture, I'm putting a radio tag on a captured martin, um, which is just a little tiny, less than one gram backpack uh, that helps me figure out where the martins are. And you can see the radio tag on a released bird in the middle picture. And in the right picture, I'm holding a Phoebe that I banded for a volunteer project, which I just included so that you can see my face. Uh, but today, I actually want to talk to you about one of my passion advocacy projects, bird window collision re uh, reduction. But before we talk about that, let's talk about migration. So as a background, over 50% of our breeding birds in North America are migratory. And migration means periodic large-scale movements of populations of animals. So not just uh, individual animals, but huge groups of animals. Uh, that all breed together um, and are genetically similar, um, all moving at the same time. 65% of our patients are migratory, that's great. <laughs> um, and migration can be classified by a distance. So we have resident birds, which are birds that are in your area all year round, short distance migrants, which might be birds that migrate up and down a mountain range uh, at certain times of year, but don't go very much farther than that. Medium distance birds, which may go 100 or 200 miles like blue jay or long distance migrants, which may travel over thousands of miles each migration, like the black pole warbler that migrates from South America to the boreal forest. Um, so many of our migrants move at night and are called nocturnal migrants. So on the right, I have a, a GIF of nocturnal migration over Miami. So this is the Miami radar and we're looking at the raw radar imagery and we're seeing, can you guys see my pointer? I hope so, maybe not, is it, can I use this? Yes, we can. Me? Oh, you can see the pointer, okay, cool. Um, so this blossom of, of, it's called reflectivity when the, what the data that you're seeing gets brighter, all of that is birds. So we're waiting, we're waiting, civil twilight hits and then suddenly the air is full of birds. And when I say raw radar, uh, what I mean by that is the, the radar that you see on the weather channel has been filtered to only show you precipitation. But when you look at the radar as it, as it comes as a product right out of the device itself, you can actually see animals, precipitation and all sorts of other things. So th this on the right over here, these two lines are sea breezes. Um, and that's just the beginning of what you can, can start to see with radar. Can you see the radar yourself? Yes, there are many tools to do this. And the, the tool that I like to recommend for beginners or bird interested people uh, is called BirdCast. So BirdCast is a product produced by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, Colorado State University and UMass Amherst. And it's a very stylized product. Uh, of, and I've linked to it here. So hopefully Hannah can send out the slides to all of our participants so you can get all these links. Um, but they, every single night of migration, BirdCast puts out a bird migration forecast. So you can actually, with computer modeling and all of the radar data that we've accumulated over the years, 
predict what nights of a season are going to have better migration based on weather and, and former patterns. So this, this uh, is from April 4th, so about, about nine days ago. And you can see migration in South Florida was a little low, but in North Florida was medium to high as, you, as birds are moving up the coast. And there is actually a, a substantial movement in the Midwest as well. So I like to think that we're in the golden age of migration uh, as birders, because there are all sorts of online tools that you can use to become really involved with how birds are moving over your landscape. And BirdCast is also great because it tells you in an estimate of millions of birds, how many birds are flying over the US every night. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, there's also a tool from NOAA called the Weather and Climate Toolkit, which allows you to view unprocessed ra radar data, but there's a bit of a learning curve. Um, so typically I like to recommend BirdCast if you're interested. Oh, and Hannah's linked it in the chat. Thanks, Hannah. So now let's talk about Miami. When we're thinking about Miami, do we think about it as a safe haven or an ecological trap for birds? So if you've never taken an, eco an ecology class, an, eco uh, an ecological trap is a scenario in which rapid environmental change leads organisms to prefer to settle in poor quality habitats. And let's remember that rapid is at an evolutionary time scale, not a human one. So the last hundred years may not seem rapid in human terms, but a hundred years in evolutionary time is barely a blip. So on the left, I have a current picture of Miami and on the right, there's a landscape view where you can see that Miami is pretty interesting in that it's surrounded by pre preserves and national parks. So ideally this is good habitat for birds. And then you have an urban matrix right adjacent to all of that good habitat. So let's look at what Miami beach looks like in 1926. Oh, my clicker will work. Do you think it, and you can answer in the chat, do you think that this landscape from 1926 had the same mortality risks to birds as the recent landscape? So say we have a black and white warbler flying through Miami in 1926. Is that bird gonna have the same chance of making it through the landscape as current Miami? All right, I'm seeing some no's in the chat, which is great. Of course not. <laughs> of course they're not gonna be the same. Yes, so we, we have uh, high, high buildings with light pollution and window, window area, of course. So our conservation strategies for birds need to change with the times. We want birds that are migrating through Miami, uh, stopping over in neighboring green spaces or living there year round to live as long as possible and breed successfully so that we can continue to enjoy them and their roles in the ecosystems. So let's talk about those landscape risks and what we could do about them. So as an introduction, North American birds have declined 29% since 1970, totaling 3 billion birds lost. This loss is a net loss, which means that those birds, those individuals are not being replaced by yearly reproductive rates. So no matter how much the birds are breeding, that loss is not being made up on an annual basis. And this is contributed to by the main threats of habitat loss, domestic cats, and windows. Up to 1 billion birds die annually after colliding with windows just in the US. So we're not, we're not talking about the world here. We're talking about the US alone, 1 billion birds. That, that's how many we're losing. This is an annual loss, not a net loss. So some of those birds will be replaced by juveniles during the breeding season, but any bird that dies before the breeding season won't be able to breed and replace itself in the population. A lot of these mortalities occur during migration, but I also wanna be clear that this is a year round issue. Windows that are untreated can kill birds at any time. We just see more obvious collision evidence during migration because bird densities are temporarily higher during migration. And there also may be a naivety component as, as juvenile birds move through the area or if birds are moving through unfamiliar areas. And we've also seen in, in scientific literature that the threat from windows is primarily from in, increased window area, which means that the, the larger the window, the greater chance it has of killing at least one bird or multiple birds. And this effect is exacerbated by artificial light at night. And, and we know this from studying radar data. 
So ouch, that's kind of a, that's a big problem. What are we gonna do for our birds? Oh, so when we go back to our Miami evaluation, we wanna ask ourselves, does it look like Miami is designed to minimize those threats to birds? Of course not. So we have a very sad black and white warbler. But don't fret, we do have solutions, we just need to implement them. So getting to the basics, why do birds hit windows? They didn't evolve with windows, so they can't see the glass. They don't have mechanisms in their eyes to be able to see glass. And they may see reflected vegetation in the window and think it's refuge. So th they're being confused by our landscape. They didn't evolve with it. They're trying to interpret it using the mechanisms that they evolved to navigate their landscapes and it's not working. There's a mismatch in the mechanisms they have and the, the landscapes that we're creating. So this picture on the left is a tufted titmouse uh, that I actually, I actually took this picture on campus. Um, and this, this bird is what really spurred me to, to act on uh, the problem here in Delaware. So when we're thinking about treatments, we need to focus on making the outward surface of the glass visible to birds. Applications on the inside of the glass is not effective at reducing collisions. To be able to see the glass, it has to be on the outside. So on the left here, we have another example of a window killed Harris sparrow. So a lot of times birds will hit windows and not even make it 10 feet before they die. So they just fall right out of the sky after, after colliding. And this has to do with the size of the bird and the speed of, at which they hit. So there are many ways to treat windows, but the example I have on the right is called feather friendly tape. And this is one of the most effective and, and one of my favorite applications. It's basically a double-sided tape. You peel off one side of the tape, lay it out on the window and, it, and then you peel the other side of the tape away and it leaves perfectly spaced out little dots on the window that help break up the surface area of that window. So to help visualize this impact, the Fatal Light Awareness Program um, FLAP in Canada produces annual museum display arrangements of the birds that they find in their window monitoring program in Ontario. So what you're looking at is over 2,000 birds collected by volunteers in one year in one city. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so when you think about all of the cities in North America and all residential homes, you can get an idea of just how destructive and pervasive the threat of windows is to our birds. And in fact, although there's way more monitoring done in cities, it's expected that residences kill cumulatively more birds than urban centers. So personal action is incredibly important. More land in the Eastern US is owned privately uh, than any other entity. So private landowners need to be taking control of their, of their architectural decisions. Um, and like, like I said, this, this arrangement is something they do every year. So every year they have a different, uh, a different block of thousands of birds that they arrange like this. So I think this is an issue that, that people tend to minimize and I don't think it's really their fault, um, but I'm sure all of us have seen or at least heard of a bird bouncing off of a window at someone's house and either dying or flying away afterward. And a lot of times people say, oh, well, it was fine, it flew away. But the truth is most of those birds die later from brain injuries like hemorrhaging. So just because you see a bird hit and fly away doesn't necessarily mean it's going to live. So here I actually pulled some Pelican Harbor numbers straight off their website. This is from their 2020 annual report. And we have to remember while we're looking at this that Pelican Harbor also takes in mammals. So some of these numbers are a bit biased towards mammal rehab and mammals face different threats than, than birds. But you can see that even here, uh, window collisions are a top reason for admission. And, and the birds that I'm talking about with with window collisions are passerines. So the, the largest number of admissions uh, come from passerines, which are also called uh, songbirds. And yes, uh, Hannah just put in the chat that there are over a hundred window strike patients in 2021. That's, that's too many for, for one city. And, and those are just the birds that people could catch and bring in. So we're not even talking about the, the full picture. Um. All right, so here I have a great little clip from Cornell's Lab of Ornithology, which focuses on what we can do to help mitigate the, the effect of artificial light at night uh, on migrants. 
So I'm going to play this and just let me know real quick if it's if you can hear. Can you hear this? Yep, we can hear it and see it. Okay. Sorry, I don't know why it didn't start. There we go. the cinematography in that in that video um, but it really illustrates uh, how birds are just like moths are attracted to a porch light at night birds are distracted by the lights that we have on the landscape as they're trying to navigate during their migration um, so turning off your exterior lighting is a great way to prevent birds from getting closer to your windows while they're migrating so now that we've talked about the problem what can we do about it so the general recommendation to prevent the vast majority of strikes is to break up the surface of the glass on the outside of the glass by four inches vertical spacing by two inches horizontal spacing. That will prevent most strikes. But if you wanna be absolutely sure that you're not killing hummingbirds, that should be reduced to two by two inches. And two by two is easier to remember. So that's what I mostly tell people. Um, so you'll see on the left, I have a window screen. So if you have windows, at, at your home that are already covered by a screen, that's a bird safe window. Congratulations, you've done it. Uh, any, any screen, any window that has a screen, you don't have to do anything more uh, to treat that window. If you don't have any screens on your window and you're amiable to applying one, I've linked here to a magnetic window screen that you can, it's pretty cheap. You can order it and slap it on and then your window's bird safe. And it's a very subtle way of making all of your windows uh, bird safe if you live in a community that isn't uh, workable with the other options that we have. A little bit more of a pricey option is two-way film. So this is available through Kaleidoscape and basically it's a film that you put on the outside of the window that makes it look opaque or tinted but on the outside but on the inside your view is not obstructed. Um, so that's great for privacy reasons if you're on a first floor apartment. Yes, external screens. So internal screens uh, aren't effective, external screens are. So this is just insect screening. Um, all right, so those are two options and here are two more. On the left, we've seen before the feather friendly uh, dot tape. So you apply it as a tape and then peel off the back and it leaves you with, with these very equally spaced dots. I personally really love this option because the the dots remind me of shading and comic book illustrations. Uh, I know some people don't like it, but there's something really satisfying about having perfectly placed dots in little rows. And maybe that's my own tendency towards neatness, but I think it's really cool looking and it's available for resident and commercial applications. And, but if you're on a budget or you live in a rental community, the option on the right might be good for you, which is tempura or chalk paint. So this is washable paint that you just create designs on the outside of your window with. This is what I do in my apartment complex because I rent here and I have to move at least once a year. 
Um, so I just, every few months or so, take my chalk marker and draw on my two windows and one glass door. And I know then that my birds, that my windows are all bird safe. And you can get really creative with this. I like, I think this is a, a restaurant or a storefront. Um, and it's a, it's a great way to employ an artist in the community or just get your creative outlet out. Um, this drawing isn't perfect. I gotta say there are some spaces here that aren't quite two by two inches. So I would fill that in a little bit more, um, but it's still a really fun way uh, to, to get people in the community asking like, hey, what, what's all that art about? And then you can use it as an advocacy tool to say, oh, I'm making my windows bird safe and, and get the word out there. So I got a question, do the dots make it more difficult to wash the windows? As far as I know, no, they're pretty sturdy and they're meant to be a more permanent option. Uh, so you should just be able to Windex right over them. They are removable with a, uh, like a razor blade or a putty knife, um, but they're, they're meant to be more permanent. So this isn't something that I would recommend for a rental apartment, um, but if you own your own house or you own your own business, this is a great option for that. And uh, I have one more DIY uh, cheaper treatment and this is called a copian bird saver. So it's basically just hanging cord. So you can either just pin it up at the top of the window and let it hang freely or pin it up at both the top and the bottom. And you can buy these from bird savers or you can make them yourself. And this obscures the glass enough um, on the vertical plane that the birds can tell there's there's a window there. And you also get the added benefit of the reflection of the cord on the window pane, which, which helps make it more effective. Um, and this is a really cost-effective DIY option. I've linked here to uh, where you can, on Home Depot, buy 50 feet of paracord for $9 and that'll treat lots of windows. So it's, it doesn't obscure your view as much as the dots. Um, and it's a great option that you can do at home if you're, if you're able-bodied to do so. And if any of these options don't work for you, there is a whole database of bird safe rated treatments available through American Bird Conservancy. And I'm talking hundreds of options. So there is definitely like any aesthetic that you're looking for, um, you can find an option through their database. They're doing great work. Okay, let me check the chat. I have big glass doors and windows, but I've never seen a bird or Clyde with any of them. Do I have to do anything? I would say yes, because- It may have collided and you didn't see it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, it might've collided and you didn't see it. There's no way that we can monitor all of our windows all the time. And it's always safer just to treat the window than to not treat it. And um, like we're talking about animal lives. So it's always better to do something about it than to, to not think it's a problem. So now that we've talked about some effective treatments, Let's look at a well-meaning but ineffective treatment. So who can tell me in the chat why this is not an effective treatment? Yes, exactly. The, the glass isn't broken up enough. These little bird decals are the bane of my existence. <laughs> because they are so often marketed as a way to reduce collisions, but they're not marketed in a way that, get, that informs customers of the spacing that is needed for it to be effective. And what, what's frustrating about this picture is that this homeowner is almost certainly someone that likes birds. They have a little birdhouse, they have some Adirondack chairs, they have what, a little cabin back here to overlook their mountains. And they, all, they must have seen a bird hit these windows and said, oh, I need to do something about it. Went to their local bird store and bought these dinky little bird decals and slapped a few of them up there and thought they were good. But that window is not going to, it's not gonna prevent collisions in this form. We need to be making sure we're, we're applying that two by two inch spacing for it to be effective. So all of these windows, except the ones down here with the little screens, those are bird safe but all of this surface area is not bird safe. And you'll eat. if a bird is flying up and sees the, sh the reflection of the trees, it's gonna fly towards the trees and not, it's not gonna pay any attention to these decals. And often the, the little bird decals are marketed as being like hawk silhouettes or predator silhouettes, and that'll help scare away the smaller songbirds. And that's just not proven to be true. And again, these, these are not spaced effectively. 
So how do we know the treatments work? So this is a little clip from the National Geographic that uh, they documented how American Bird Conservancy is, is systematically testing these treatments. Most people don't even realize how many birds are being killed by windows. Almost everybody you'll meet will say, yes, I've seen a bird hit a window. Almost all those people think it's unusual. How many birds have to hit windows for everybody to have been around when one happened? They're hitting all the time. Oh, sorry, that was me. We've created the tunnel because we're trying to develop a standard test. We're testing primarily the patterns on the glass and how well birds will avoid them. The birds that we use and catch from the wild here in the Bronx along the Bronx River. We set up very fine nets. They'll fly and land in the net and then they'll bounce down into a little pocket. It's all very soft and gentle. It's an age old way of catching birds that ornithologists have been using to study a lot of bird questions. The birds we're looking at are the birds that are moving through during migration. So we identify it, we put the band on, and then we will release the bird into the test chamber. The birds see two pieces of glass. One of those pieces of glass has a pattern. The other is a plain piece of glass that is invisible to the birds. What we're asking them really is, if you want to get out of here, which way would you go? 1805. And before the birds actually reach the glass, there's a piece of very fine netting stretched across the end of the tunnel. We have tested materials that 90% of birds will avoid. If you put vertical lines four inches apart, most birds won't try to fly through there. On the other hand, they can slip through a four inch gap that's horizontal. So you have to bring it down to two inches. Yes. Setting up the tunnel turned out to be a bit of a breakthrough. There is now a credit in the lead system, the, the green building rating system for reducing bird collisions that is directly based on the work that we've been doing. It doesn't matter where on the scale of pragmatic to idealistic you fall, there are reasons to protect birds. Our future, our lives are very dependent on having healthy bird populations. I would like to be able to test pretty much any material that is out there for commercial construction, because I know that the more options there are, the more architects will be willing to use different kinds of materials in a bird-friendly design. Yeah, so the American Bird Conservancy is doing incredible work um, and they definitely need more recognition, recognition for what they're doing. Um, they're really setting the standard. So now that we've talked about the problem and how we can fix it, let's look to a role model city that is banded together for bird safe infrastructure and that is in Toronto, Canada. Northern Oriole, the Baltimore Oriole, just again. Sadly, we pick apart too many of this particular species. They hit with such tremendous force that they, they tend to die more frequently than some of the smaller species do. The impact is too great for them to sustain.
quite frankly, it's, it's a, an issue that is, it really isn't difficult to, to fix. Any reflections in there? It's not bird friendly at all, actually. It's like a mirror. Many of these birds are endangered, and so if we can build our uh, built environment in a way that reduces migratory bird deaths, it's a good thing. <laughs> In Toronto, we have so many towers that just one hundred percent glass. This building is only thirty-seven percent glass. That helps with the bird strike issue. It also helps insulate the building. So it's a much better insulated building than you would normally get for a condo in Toronto. So at this particular site, we were finding an average of hundred birds a year. Since the, these markers have gone up, we've been finding one, maybe two birds a year at this particular facade. So it's, it's definitely doing its job quite beautifully. The less birds that are killed in, by collisions with buildings in Toronto, the more will make it up to the boreal forest to breed. I think that the city of Toronto should be very proud of the work they've done. <laughs> They should be proud of the work they've done and, and it's exciting to see a city get creative with their solutions to an environmental problem. And just like Michael Measure, the scientist in the beginning said, it's not a difficult problem to solve. We just have to want to do it. Oh. So this is a screenshot that I pulled from that video. And if you'll notice, this is the flyway that they illustrated with the animation of the birds migrating over Toronto. If we follow the, the eastern coast of the, of the United States south, we hit Miami. So Miami birds are correct, co connected to Toronto. And I like to think that all of our communities are, are connected by birds. So when thinking about birds, I encourage people to think in both big circles and little circles. And this is a trick that I learned from a journalism professor years ago. Um, a big circle, big circle thinking is recognizing that birds need consideration on a global level because they're often global species. So we should encourage international collaboration and conversations. Little circle thinking is small scale, your actions in your community. What can you personally do at home, work, or in your town that will collectively help push big circle ideas? It's, it's a huge problem nowadays, uh, this like environmental doomsday mindset that, that is overwhelming, that environmental problems are overwhelming and there's nothing that we can do about it. And, and I like this big circle, little circle thinking, I think is a great tool to help you get out of that negative mindset and, and get your uh, actions on the ground. What can you do in your little circle that can make a difference? Um, because there's, it's more empowering to, to make decisions in your town because you have more power in, in your local community. And, and when, when you see the results of your own actions, uh, affecting positive change. There's nothing better than that. So if you're struggling with environmental doomsday thinking, this is a great tool that I've found to help get through it. And just to reiterate the global scale of birds, this is a map of flyways. So this is, these are like migratory bird highways that, that ornithologists have mapped out. And we're talking specifically for Miami about the Atlantic Americas flyway. And which is also the flyway that all, of, all the Delaware birds come from, um, but this overlaps with the Mississippi Americas flyway. And this is great for thinking not only about conservation implications of where birds are in the landscape, but also about disease risk. So right now in Delaware, we're dealing with the avian influenza outbreak. Um, and when we're thinking about diseases that could come from birds, we need to be thinking about all the different places that our birds come from and what we can do uh, in all of those communities to mitigate those risks. It's also really helpful to know that other places in the world are already doing something about the problem. So this is a list of cities 
And as you can see there, uh, there's Miami is on this list. So this, this list is cities which currently have lights out programs. And that just means there's an initiative to get volunteers to turn off their lights at night during migration. And most of these likely have some sort of monitoring program in place that you could get involved with if you don't see your city on this list. Uh, so if you're not someone who hails from Miami, uh, if you look at all of these cities, maybe your city's on this list. And if it's not, that means there's a golden opportunity to start one in your own community. But back to a bird specific level, what do you do if you find a collision victim? So the first thing I wanna stress is that we do not want to handle wild animals beyond what is necessary to get the medical attention. Handling is stressful and stress can often kill them before their injuries do. And secondly, we do not ever attempt to rehab birds ourselves. It is federally illegal and requires specialized training and equipment. And I'm sure Pelican Harbor has dealt with people that try to rehab birds on their own and it, and it ends disastrously. And even in a professional wildlife rehab center, rehab is not always successful. So we wanna give those birds the best chance of recovery by bringing it to an appropriate facility. That being said, if you do find a victim and you can catch it, you wanna place that bird into a dark breathable container such, such as a shoe box or cardboard box and do not provide food or water. This is because it can often cause more problems than it would help. And different rehabs have different protocols. So I've linked to the Pelican Harbor specific protocols there as a reference. Um, but if you're not uh, local to Pelican Harbor, then I've listed some other rehab resources on the right. But you have the bird in the box, it's safely contained, so it's not going to injure itself. You want to take that bird to a licensed rehabber as soon as possible. And the reason why I'm emphasizing license is that in a lot of places, there are rehabbers that don't have proper certifications. They're kind of like backyard rehabbers. And these places aren't going to have the appropriate resources or funding necessary to give that bird the best chance. Um, and if you're wondering, like you see a bird and you're wondering, well, how do I know if it's hurt enough to intervene? Like, should I just let nature uh, do its thing? If a bird is stunned enough to allow you to capture it, it needs medical attention. That's the general rule I tell people. Different rehabbers will have different uh, rules on this, but in general, if you can hold it in your hand and put it in a box, it needs to be looked at by a professional. And if I haven't given you enough resources already, I have more. So the first is the Audubon Action Center. And this is an online policy advocacy platform that allows you to write to your representatives about different uh, bird conservation problems. So you can write to them, say, I want bird safe infrastructure in my community. I want a lights out program in my community. I want to outlaw feral cats in my community. Uh, anything of that, that nature, they have an online platform to make it very easy to do that. Uh, locally in Miami, there's Lights Out Miami run by Tropical Audubon Society. So if you're in Miami and you would like to get involved to help out with this issue, I, I highly recommend reaching out to them. There's also D-Bird, uh, which if you're a birder, you might be familiar with eBird, which is a site that birders mm -hmm. use to report their sightings. D-Bird is pretty much the same thing, but for dead birds. <laughs> so if you see a bird and you're not in a monitoring, monitoring program and you don't have collecting permits, um, you can always take a picture. Everyone has a cell phone in their pocket. You can take a picture with your cell phone and upload it to D-Bird. Another incredible resource that I can't stress enough is Heidi Trudell, and I've linked to her website. She is a specific uh, environmental consultant on preventing bird window collisions. So if, you are in a, if you're not in a position to DIY your windows, you can hire her to outfit your commercial building or your, your home to make your landscape as bird safe as possible. And she runs the Dead, bird, Dead Birds for Science Facebook page, which has been instrumental in teaching me about the widespread impact of this problem. Like I would not be as passionate about this problem if it weren't for Heidi. So I highly recommend her. Um, there, there are also tons of iNaturalist projects. If you go to iNaturalist.org, lots of university campuses have organized projects on there to document uh, bird collisions with pictures, and all of that data is important in pushing policy measures too. So any picture you take and upload to a database is going to be used to protect birds in the future. And again, FLAP Canada, which is the organization that does the monitoring in Ontario and, and does the 
advocacy arrangements with the specimen birds that they collect. And if you're interested in a print resource, uh, Daniel Clem, a professor at Muhlenberg College, recently published this book called Solid Air. And uh, Dr. Clem has uh, focused on his research almost like his research is focused specifically on bird window collisions for almost 50 years. So he is a, a world expert in what we can do about saving birds from windows. So highly recommend that resource as well if you would like something on your shelf. So last slide, uh, what is the most important thing that we learned today? If you want to say it in the chat or scream it aloud to the heavens, <laughs> you are welcome to do so. What's the number one thing I'm hoping that you will take away from this presentation? No. Birds need help, that's good. Decals only work on external windows. Locate wildlife rehabber. Not quite, not yet. <laughs> I'll, I'll just give it to you. So the most important is that we need to treat our windows. And that recommendation is at a two by two inch marking. Yes, treat your windows. That, there you go, Matt. Um, it's not as hard as it may appear to help. I agree with that. Uh, number two would be to turn off our exterior lights. So turning off lights is gonna prevent birds flying overhead from being unnecessarily distracted and coming into the landscape. We don't want those birds to hit the windows. We don't want them to unnecessarily lose energy on their taxing migrations. So turning off exterior lights is incredibly important. And does anyone wanna guess the, the third call to action? I don't think anyone said it yet. Yes, there we go. Thanks, Susan. We wanna advocate for change. We wanna be contacting our representatives. We wanna be talking to our neighbors, our friends, etc. We wanna be talking about this issue as publicly as much as possible. We wanna make it trendy to have bird safe communities. Um, like someone said in the chat, this is not a hard problem. There are tons of environmental problems that are much harder to solve than this problem. We can do something about this. Um, and we can, if we can't, if you can't change your windows, if you, can't talk to your city council for whatever reason, you can always donate to rehab centers and other mitigation efforts. Uh, putting money where the problem is, is always a good solution. And if you're interested in some of the literature, I've, I've listed my references here. And with that, I have some acknowledgments to make acknowledgments to make. I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Jeff Bueller, for allowing me to go on these tangents that have absolutely nothing to do with my research. Uh, I'd like to thank um, my committee members, Dr. Ian Stewart and Dr. Vincenzo Ellis, as well as the entirety of the Aeroecology program at UD. I'm so lucky to be in such a welcoming program, and I really can't recommend this program enough. So if you're a grad, if you're a student looking to get into grad school, I highly recommend uh, University of Delaware. I'd also like to thank my funding agencies, the Purple Martin Conservation Association, the Delaware Nature Society, the Delaware Ornithological Society, the Delaware Audubon Society, and MODIS Wildlife Tracking System for allowing me to do my research. And I'd also like to thank Pelican Harbor for having me. So if, uh, with that out of the way, uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them, although I've been taking them throughout the chat as well. And if you think of any later, please feel free to email me. I've listed my email here. I am happy to email in, or email you any answers to questions you have or get you connected with any resources that I might know of. And if you're interested in learning more about what I do in a general sense, I, I've listed my link tree as well. So feel free, I'll, I'll be monitoring the chat and you can also unmute yourself if you're, if you're interested. So let's see, I have. With the worst offenders being large corporations or landlords, um, do you have any suggestions on how we can convince businesses that it's in their interest to invest in bird safe treatments for windows on their properties? We would hope they would do it because it's the right thing, but unfortunately a lot of them need more of a nudge in the right direction. Yes, so one thing that I've thought about is ki killing migratory birds with the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is technically illegal in the United States. Granted, there aren't a lot of enforcements in place for this. Um, so one thing that I've thought about is maybe on a local or even federal scale, we if there was some way to enforce um, inc incidental take, which is what it would be classified as, uh, 
as if you're the building owner and your building is killing birds, that would be classified as incidental take, then that building owner should be responsible for contributing money towards conservation funds, like sort of mitigation costs. So you can advocate for that kind of change. You can also just put a lot of public pressure on businesses and corporations um, to do the right thing. Um, there, there are limits to this as, as there are limits to everything, but I think you're right. I think we need to be pushing more systematic change as, as well as private landowner change. But I don't wanna discount the effect that private landowners can make just by um, making changes on their home landscape. Thank you so much, Katie. This was so interesting. I mean, even I learned a lot, so. Oh, uh, thank you. I'm glad to be able to take some of this back uh, back to the troop and uh, see what kind of changes we can even make uh, internally at Pelican Harbor and to our education programs. So you're doing amazing work. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>